Um, all right, Lydia, thank you for joining me today. Um, as you know, this is a, a little preview of Meet the Speakers before our session we recorded uh, last week um, for the virtual ADA uh, symposium. And um, I just thought I'd take a chance to chat with you a little bit and um, hear a little bit about you, a little bit about your science. Um, so why don't you start by just telling us about the science that you're most interested in, most, most excited about? Uh, my passion is some metabolism, how metabolic networks coordinate the basic needs of the cell, like bioenergetics, anabolic pathways, and most importantly to us, self-made decisions. So we're really interested in the idea that the intracellular metabolites can contribute to the regulation of important cellular functions, like the decision to self-renew or differentiate. And so um, when did you get interested in this? So I know that you did a um, graduate studies with uh, Marsha Haggis and then went on and did some postdoctoral studies with Craig Thompson. But when did your passion for metabolism start? It's my entire scientific career has been around metabolism. I sort of fell into a lab as an undergraduate. I, um, I was on the track team in college and uh, I tell everybody this story. So people might've heard it if anyone's listening. Um, I was on the track team in college and I was really bothered by the fact that um, if you did a hard workout, a hard lifting workout, you were sore, not immediately after the workout, not an hour later, but the next day. And that really bothered me. It didn't make any sense from what I knew. And so I gathered the courage one day to ask the physiology professor after class why this might be. And he said, I don't know, but you should come work in my lab. So um, I started working with Daryl Neufer, who is now at East Carolina University. Um, at the time, he was at Yale, and we were studying how pyruvate dehydrogenase was regulated during recovery from exercise in rat skeletal muscle. And ever since then, I've just been passionate about metabolism. When I interviewed for graduate school, there wasn't a lot of cell metabolism research going on at the time. It was mostly diabetes-related research. Um, so I rotated in a lot of diabetes labs at Harvard, but uh, my last rotation was with brand new PI, Marsha Haigas, who studied cell metabolism, in particular mitochondrial metabolism. And Marsha was a great mentor, and I joined her lab, and so I've really been in the cell metabolism world ever since. Yeah, so the phenomenon you're mentioning, of course, is delayed onset muscle soreness, or DOMS. Um, so do we still know, or do we yet know, uh, uh, what causes DOMS, or why we're sore two days later? <laughs> so, so, so for all the times I tell this story, that's always the follow-up question, and I should look it up. Um, <laughs> if anyone out there knows, please please let me know. I'd be, I would be very curious to know the answer. Okay. So, um, so for the, um, the talk that you gave for the virtual symposium uh, for the ADA this year, you touched on some, um, some new work uh, recently published in uh, Nature Cell Biology um, about an interesting role for serine. So why don't you just give us a sense, um, sort of an overview or teaser of uh, what you're going to be talking about? So the story that I'm going to be telling you about is about how the endogenous metabolic networks of stem cells, in this case, epidermal stem cells, control their likelihood to differentiate or to self-renew. And that decision of differentiation versus self-renewal is really important in tumor initiation. And so in this manner, the metabolic profile of a stem cell has really critical consequences for whether or not the cell will ultimately form a tumor. We did not set out to study serine metabolism. We were just interested in the metabolic profile of stem cells that were or were not likely to ultimately form a cancer. And serine is the metabolite that popped out as being the most differentially regulated, which led us down this road to uh, understanding that how cell acquires serine has important consequences for its regulation of cell identity. But we never set out to study serine. I think all of the best findings we've ever made in the lab have come not because we had some great idea that this particular metabolite or pathway would be important, but just by listening to the cells and letting them tell us what was really important for them. So do you often take um, these unbiased or you know, metabolomic or proteomic or some of these unbiased approaches or, or do you prefer a sort of the hypothesis? I have got this you know, crazy idea and we have to go test it. Which, which do you prefer? We do both. Uh, we definitely do both. Um, certainly, I think there's a great uh, hypothesis driven research is the cornerstone of what we do and is really important. It's also very good for follow ups. So one big initial discovery from an unbiased approach can yield multiple hypothesis-driven pro um, projects. But in the end, I find that the coolest discoveries we make are not ones that we would have preconceived. Um, and that letting the cell tell us how it solves problems 
is the most exciting route to finding new, interesting answers to questions. So then take us back to, to this sort of discovery on serine. So you did a, a unbiased metabolomic uh, profile and you come up with serine. Um, what was that like? What did you think when you saw that? Uh, it, so, you know, like I think all of our discoveries, it's never one particular experiment that is necessarily a eureka moment where you're in the dark room and you've solved it. Um, it's rather a collection of a lot of different pieces of evidence coming together that allow a picture to start to form. So we did do unbiased profiling of amino acid consumption. We did find that serine was the most different. And that would have been intriguing in and of itself, maybe not super exciting. But what it was coupled with was also some tracing of glucose utilization in cells. So we did isotope tracing to see how cells were using glucose and glutamine. And we saw that actually the wild type epidermal stem cells used a ton of glucose to form serine de novo. We have done tracing for eight or nine years um, across multiple cancer cells and stem cells. And this was the highest level of de novo serine synthesis that I've ever seen. So that was interesting to me. I thought, wow, these cells are making a ton of serine. And then when we also saw that they had differences in the way that they were taking up the serine, those two pieces together made us realize there's something really different about serine here. And we were excited at the time because serine has been implicated in cancer progression and it's a metabolite that sits at the crossroads of a lot of important metabolic pathways. Uh, but it was, and we were excited because we hadn't studied it yet in the lab. And here was a new pathway regulating sulfate that we hadn't thought about. It ended up that serine converged on a pathway that we did think about a lot. So it ended up being not so novel in the end in terms of a completely new avenue for stem cells to regulate their fate. But uh, it was very exciting for us to arrive at this conclusion in a totally orthogonal way. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that I was um, uh, interested in after your talk, and I, I might have asked you about then, um, is thinking about these privileged roles for some amino acids versus, or metabolites even, yeah. versus um, uh, sort of uh, broad roles for metabolites in signaling. And so um, just if you're thinking about serine and thinking about its relationship to um, other metabolites that might yeah. uh, be signaling, uh, the sort of interesting and million dollar question is, um, is this unique to serine? Or is this you know much more broad phenomenon that just happens to be serine in this uh, instance? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> this is something that I think is really interesting to think about. And certainly, I think we talked about this a little after my talk. Um, work from your lab and many others has shown that there is a lot of promiscuity for metabolic enzymes. And so when in a textbook it might say an enzyme uses substrate A to produce product B, um, that's just might mean that A is the preferred substrate, but not the only substrate. And it could also use related substrates, which now it amplifies by orders of magnitude the potential metabolic reactions that are occurring in the cell. So on paper, I think there are a few clear metabolic nodes where some metabolites that seem to be privileged sit. Serine since sits at the intersection of nucleotide biosynthesis, methylation reactions, redox regulation, amino acid homeostasis. So you could make a really nice logic um, for why serine should be an important regulatory molecule, or maybe it's just a coincidence. Um, but I think as we start to understand how these metabolic pathways come together, and really the diversity of metabolic pathways that are actually occurring in the cell, not just on the textbook page, I think we'll have a better idea to what extent it is just these few metabolites versus a lot of potential reactions. Yeah, we think a lot about metabolic logic as well. Uh, the challenge, though, of course, is you apply this logic after you sort of have some data or have an answer. And so how much of this logic was um, sort of built into uh, the system versus um, how much do we just sort of apply on it, sort of our own heuristics and biases um, is a is a sort of challenge. Um, I think that's a real challenge for us. I, I definitely, one of my main weaknesses is often attributing a reason um, to a phenomenon that we observe when we have to remind ourselves that it might just be because it is. Um, <laughs> cells are perfect. And there's always a trade-off, right? Precision um, and accuracy versus rate and magnitude. And so cells might just be making messy trade-offs sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting if we sort of uh, uh, take a philosophical um, sort of break for a moment here. Um, we also ask why questions oftentimes, um, knowing that we don't 
ever or won't ever know if there is an answer to a why question. Um, but we like the thought exercise to oftentimes try to understand why something might be might allow you to gain a different perspective or to learn something about the system or realize something about the system you might not otherwise. Absolutely, because then it helps you to figure out if you've found a phenomenon, um, figuring out why that phenomenon might exist will help you design experiments to test whether or not that phenomenon is important, um, whether or not it affects a phenotype that's relevant. So even if the why is incidental, it does help you get to the ultimate function of this observation. So then tell me about some of the why questions that you're interested in now or some of the big picture things that you're most excited to uh, follow up on. Oh, uh, what, one of the, the big picture question we're really interested in um, is to what degree is the metabolic profile of a cell um, just secondary to the identity of a cell? Is it, uh, does a liver cell have liver metabolism because it's expressing liver genes? Or does that metabolic profile also contribute to the establishment and maintenance of cell identity? So to what degree are these two um, sides of the coin actually related? And uh, one model system we use a lot to address this question is embryonic stem cells because they are actually a great model system for studying cell metabolism. They, especially with regards to cell fate, because you can culture them in a lot of defined conditions where they will have subtly or not so subtly different cell identities, but you can control the media, you can control the growth rates, you can control these external variables. And then you can ask to what degree is cell identity secondary uh, or cell metabolism secondary to cell identity and vice versa, to what degree is cell identity conferred by that metabolic profile? So we've done... um, a lot of work in that area. The first paper from our lab was showing actually that metabolic profiles are an intrinsic feature of cell identity. So the more you are pluripotent, the better you are at self renewal, the less you care about oxidizing your glutamine. Why that is, I don't know. And that's something that's really interesting to us. So one question, one why question we're really interested in is why do embryonic stem cells have different metabolism? Why can they do these weird things like grow without exogenous glutamine, which most of our cells need? Is this something to do with the developmental environment from which they've arisen? Um, Something about the inner cell mass um, or the oviduct somehow um, promoting this alternate metabolism that's preserved in culture? Uh, Or is this alternate metabolism important for reinforcing cell fate? Um, So these these are some of the questions we're really excited about. Presumably, one of the other things you could do with a stem cell model is you can um, specifically drive different uh, fates of these stem cells and ask questions about how the metabolism changes. So exactly. you might be able to get some causal evidence of overexpressing transcription factors to then drive a developmental cascade or, or something. Exactly right. And then you can say, does this metabolic profile specifically affect the ability to differentiate into this lineage? And if so, is that because of selection? Is it just because to grow and survive under these differentiating conditions, you need this metabolic profile? Or is it because it's facilitating the ability of that transcription factor to do its job and establish this lineage? So is it, um, I think this, is it a biochemical selection or is it a um, actual cell fate regulation um, at the level of the nucleus? So that's another really big question we are interested in. We've found in a couple different contexts now that this metabolite alpha ketoglutarate is important for driving differentiation in established tumors. And um, May Kong's lab at UC Irvine has also found this. We found it in pancreatic cancer now, squamous cell carcinoma, and May Kong has found it in colon cancer. So this is, I think, is very satisfying um, in light of all the evidence that IDH mutations are causal for tumor formation. So alpha ketoglutarate is the flip side of that coin and can essentially be anti-tumorigenic in many ways. But to me, that's a really optimistic observation that a malignant tumor state could actually maybe be reversed um, or subverted by a metabolic change. But the question is why? How, how do you ultimately go from a single metabolite changing to a coherent program of gene expression changing? That's not a trivial question. And In my view, it argues that you have to have transcription factors that are present, but that are metabolically constrained in their ability to act. And so that's a major avenue in the lab that we're really interested in understanding. Are there sort of latent transcription factors lying around in cells that just can't do their jobs? And are there other ones that can do their jobs? And metabolism helps you determine which set of transcription factors get to win. 
So then do you think there's going to be this whole undiscovered set of uh, metabolite sensing transcription factors? So that's, I don't know whether or not the metabolite is directly acting on the transcription factor or if it's just enabling a permissive chromatin landscape that now allows that transcription factor to act. I don't know. This is something um, a postdoc in my lab is working very hard on using um, some biochemical techniques that we're excited about. Huh. Very cool. Uh, so then just a couple of um, some final questions, just some bigger picture things. So uh, you are a uh, young undergraduate um, who sort of uh, went to Daryl Neufer and uh, asked about uh, DOMS or ended up in Daryl's lab. Um, how do you find uh, the next Lydia? You've had a highly successful graduate and, and postdoc career. Um, so what do you look for um, for the next Lydia that then would join your lab? This is probably the thing I struggle with most. Um, as a as a lab head, how to define who are the best people to hire for the group, because we are all so much a product of our training environment and how to uncouple the potential of a researcher from their environment, the chances they've had, the opportunities they've had, I think is almost impossible. My goal is as much as possible to look at the potential, uh, the, the future slope, uh, rather than the actual level of accomplishment. And I don't, I don't think there's any easy way to do that, um, but I'm very interested in people's trajectories, what they've done, um, and their curiosity. To me, the passion for science is very important. And when people show that they've really thought about whatever data they have, even if it's just a blank Western blot, which is all I ever generated as an undergraduate. Sorry, Daryl. Um, I... If they're still really excited about that blank Western blot and still going back for more, which is literally how I started in science, um, then then I'm sold because I think that passion and perseverance are, are really important. All right, excellent. Well, uh, we'll finish there on that note. So thank you for your time. Okay, thanks, Matt. <laughs>